Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's event. There is always a rainbow in the cloud, brought to you by Tech at Workplace Pride. This event will be recorded, so if you're currently watching the recording, I appreciate that you take the time to do so. My name is Danny Bielitz. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I will be your moderator today. Before formally opening the event, I want to share just a few words about myself. I work as a data scientist for the IBM Client Innovation Center, Benelux, and I'm based on Groningen. I also co-lead the Eagle Benelux chapter, which is our LGBT plus community at IBM here in the Benelux. Personally and professionally, I'm both very passionate about data and AI, especially about uh, AI ethics. And today's event will cover some very interesting topics that are very relevant to discussions about AI ethics and how it relates to the LGBT plus community. If you have joined previous editions of the Tech at Workplace Pride events, then you already know that every year the Tech at Workplace Pride program organizes an event from different cities in the Netherlands. After Delft, Eindhoven, and Enschede, it is now Groningen's turn to organize this Tech at Workplace Pride event. Unfortunately, we cannot host a meeting in the IBM offices in Groningen to the obvious reasons, but I still want to share some impressions of this beautiful and vibrant city with you and hope that you can visit us soon. Bart, right, can you please uh, share the video? Welcome to Groningen. Groningen is a vibrant and creative city in the north of the Netherlands, and this is what I love about it. Groningen is one of the happiest cities in Europe, and seriously, everyone here is friendly. Groningen is the youngest city in the Netherlands. Every fifth person is a student. Most of the people are between the 20 and the 24 years old. This makes the city even more vibrant. The bars in the city center don't even have a closing time. I'm not kidding. You get to party here 24 hours a day. Cheers. belongs to the top five best cycle cities in the world. Cars aren't even allowed in the city center. This makes it even better and safer for pedestrians and bikers. There are lots of things that you can do here. You can either spend your day shopping, visiting impressive old buildings, climbing the Martini Torre for good views, Learn more about the Dutch culture in a Groninger Museum or eat the famous local snack called the Eierball. If you haven't been here yet, you should definitely check it out because Amsterdam is not the only cool city in the Netherlands. I hope you enjoyed this short video uh, and that it gave you some reasons to visit Groningen soon. Maybe one more, more reason, Groningen was uh, this year named uh, in the top 20 of best small cities in the world. So yeah, I hope that you can, can come visit us uh, soon and find out why. And now, without uh, further ado, I want to give the word to Peter Zeilema, General Manager of IBM Benelux and ex Executive Sponsor of our local Eagle LGBT community here in IBM Benelux, and also to Levin Fishman, Managing Director of the IBM Client Innovation Center Benelux, to give some background about IBM. Okay, so so Peter, if you are, are okay, I will start. Um, so at least I saw the eyeball in the video, uh, Danny, so I never tasted it yet, but uh, I, uh, I heard it, it's really nice. So I'm really sorry that we cannot have you all in our beautiful office in Groningen. It's, an, it's a great environment, uh, very dynamic and uh, very innovative. So yeah, really a pity, but good that we can still be here all together in this, uh, in this video call. 
So I'm responsible for what we call the Client Innovation Center in Groningen. So it's a team of around 250 software developers from different countries. Uh, we have more than 30 nationalities uh, in our team. And, and yeah, what we really try to achieve is really to get the best out of everybody. And for that, it is really important that we have a culture where everybody feels free, can speak out, uh, focused on inclusion and diversity. And that is for us a very serious and important topic. And, and, and for that reason, I'm very happy that we are so active in this network and, and that we can host this event. It is not only important for me as the director of the IBM uh, Client Innovation Center, but also for the larger uh, IBM. And for that, I would like to introduce our general manager, Peter Zeilema. So Peter, uh, I know that this is important to you as well. So can you explain a little bit why this is important to you and why you decided to become the executive sponsor of our uh, team in the Benelux? And indeed, my day job is to be the general manager of uh, IBM uh, Benelux. Um, I have a warm heart for Groningen because uh, I spent my youth there from my fifth year till my 18th before I went to Delft and became uh, an engineer. Uh, and so I didn't graduate in Groningen, but I know it well and um, very proud of our community there, uh, led by you, Levin, and uh, I know Danny well as, as well because indeed I'm the executive sponsor of our LGBT community. Clearly, um, you know, uh, in this uh, story, oh, just a second, somebody's calling me, let me put up my phone. Um, sorry about that. Um, clearly, this um, this environment is, is more for me, and this whole commitment is driven from um, the fact that this is deeply rooted in IBM in its uh, more than 100-year history. Uh, we were one of the first uh, who... Uh, hired uh, cultural ethnicity um, in, in, the, in the days that, uh, that Martin Luther King was still making ways of um, making people understand that equality and inclusion is, is, um, is paramount. Um, it, it's very close to my heart. It is something I'm driving very intensively uh, under my tenure in the last four years together actually with uh, Maya Lane, our HR leader. And um, I, I, got, uh, I got acquainted with the LGBT team uh, roughly two years ago. And uh, I must say, you guys stole my heart, and um, I, I really love working with you, and, and push that envelope and push that agenda. And this agenda is really about a culture of inclusion. It's about allowing diversity of thought. And uh, I really want people in my community. I, I am, um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I can host it as general manager to be truly inclusive, as such that people can be their authentic selves. Once you have that running and working you get the best out of the people and therefore you get the best outcome for your clients uh, as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's with that conviction of, of diversity, but more so knowing that it really works. And I actually, it's almost funny, but I got a note this morning from Mario Lang that somebody was reaching out to, to thank her. Um, and therefore I think us, um, for the efforts we are undertaking to make this very visible and tangible as such that that person even said you know it inspired me to step up uh, for for the things i believe in as well so this is a business priority for me huh? that's that's the point so in a way i'm honored that the lgbt team asked me to be their host and sponsor but on the other hand um, it gives me a lot of joy and, and pride um, to make this really work in practice so let's talk about it but a lot of execution and we had a lot of efforts on the female participation and the LGBT in the last two years, clearly with the whole agenda shifting and actually being a blind spot, uh, I must admit, also the cultural um, diversity is also high on our agenda at the moment as well. Um, but hey, Levin, I mean, let's face it, uh, you're in a very diverse environment, uh, but also um, of a certain, um, let's say, a life moment profile and well, we'll not call it age but i will say moment in life <laughs> um how is that to manage that 250 uh plus of those developers uh, at least that's you know mainly what they do but i'm pretty sure they do other stuff as well yeah uh, perhaps to explain a little bit about what you said so i'm by far the oldest of the team well perhaps there are a few more people that are as experienced like let's call it like that 
Now, uh, what, is, what is really important about our team is that um, our way of working, our agile way of working and, and really empowering our team to always challenge the status quo and the way we work and what we do, for that it is important that we have a culture that really uh, well, gives people uh, the feeling that they are safe to speak out so that they can, they can discuss whatever is on their mind. And with those people from those different backgrounds, this is even more important. I mean, we are not all the same. We all com come from a different background. We have different roots. We have different habits. We have different things that we think is important, but still we want really to everybody to participate. And um, if you look on um, how we work, we always work, we always work in teams. Of course, there are moments that people work on their own tasks, but the most important thing is when they come together and agree on the next step. And for that, everybody should feel free to contribute and, and contribute with all they have and, and, and all their skills and all their capabilities. So this culture and this safe environment is really crucial. And, and also the inclusion is crucial for, for the whole team really to perform and, and for people to stay and grow. And it is also an environment where you, you need to learn all the time. Things are going so fast. Um, and also there you need a very motivating and inspiring environment and diversity and inclusion and equality is, is key there. So uh, perhaps we can, we can switch a little bit to the topic of today, uh, which is AI ethics. Um, I know that we do a lot there. I know that you are very involved there as well. So could you tell us a little bit more about uh, how we contribute to that community, Peter? Well, in, in, in multiple ways, I must say. I mean, I'm pretty sure that for this team, um, I might be preaching to the choir when it comes down to how AI has changed our lives uh, and will further change our lives as such because data and the insights in data are being um, are, are being translated uh, with, with, with AI and all kinds of applications are being built on the back of AI. And it's, it's like a fabric. Uh, in, in uh, a lot of things we will do, but also in the workflows for our clients and in mainly in the human interaction. We always talked about uh, machine and human. Huh? We really believe in that that paradigm that it's, it's, it's augmentative. It is uh, really to serve um, uh, people. Um, but funny enough, it has also put our nose on uh, the notion that uh, the data does represent... <laughs> a lot of our hidden uh, biases and hidden patterns um, we, we either took for granted or weren't even aware of. And, and having that responsibility in applying AI in, 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 in the right fashion uh, is such, uh, and that's you know, slam dunk in the middle of our conversation today, I think, to really warrant equality and inclusion um, is, is where these things come together. That's where the two Venn diagrams start to overlap. Um, as the data we use, at, and mostly we use a lot of public data, is biased by nature. And, and, and as a net result, um, it, it, will, it will be not fair, and it therefore will be harder to explain and have explainable AI uh, and a responsible applied AI as such. So uh, as IBM, we were pretty early on, um, on that, on that uh, notion, actually. We started with the, with the Data uh, Act uh, in, in, in um, in, 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 uh, in Switzerland and uh, in, in Davo, uh, I think it was only three, four years ago with responsible data. And that morphed into uh, being very active in um, the um, ethics, AI ethics uh, legislation being done in, uh, in Europe uh, at, the, um, at the Union. And um, actually, I took on uh, to be the torch bearer for ethics uh, for AI in the Netherlands for the, uh, the Dutch. Uh, uh, NL Digital, it's called uh, Society, where all IT vendors are grouped together um, uh, to represent uh, that particular market to society. Um, we even made an uh, ethic code of conduct, which was also published. And I was, uh, uh, on behalf of the NL Digital, offered that to our Minister of um, Economic Affairs. And um, I think we kind of set the tone. Now, next to that, we do a lot of education and a lot of material we make available. Especially, we, we create a lot of routines and tools to allow developers um, to to um, basically build more ethical and more responsible um, applications of AI. And uh, as always, it is people work, so you can do it 
partly with technology who can filter out bias or make that aware, but it's more important that you really get it into the heads of the people to appreciate and understand that there are ethical questions that need to be answered and questioned uh, every step of the way. And um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of goodness that came from it. Um, initially, it was seen as a little bit like uh, why are you guys making so much fuss out of it, but in reality, um, it, it it paved the way for a broader debate, um, and also a debate in society, which I see now because I'm also uh, part of the Dutch AI uh, coalition in the Netherlands in the board. Uh, how do we make it an inclusive society? Uh, our society is still uh, listen. It's not so divided as in the US for sure. Uh, but I've seen that, for example, in the blind spot with uh, cultural inclusion, uh, even in our case, where we felt that we were, we should be maybe not the best, but should be at least okay. And it turned out to be a blind spot. Um, the same is basically happening in our society. And now with COVID accelerating that, but also making the chasm for some people even more, uh, because now you already, you really have to operate digitally. And you really have to trust on tools uh, you have difficulty trusting in because you don't understand it. Um, so I think all in all, it, it is um, it is a profound subject at the end of the day when you talk about equality and inclusion uh, to appreciate and understand how you drive ethics uh, in, in AI and in data. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's um, it's it's a it's a very well understood uh, overlapping Venn diagram for sure. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot, Peter, for your for your insights. So, um, uh, Danny, I think we already took a little bit too much of your time. So, um, uh, thanks for having us. Enjoy the day. Uh, I hope it will be very interesting. Uh, all the best. And uh, over to you. Thank you, Danny. Have fun, guys. Thank you. Bye, Danny. Thank, Bye. thank you, Peter. Thank you, Levin. Bye, team. And, yeah, thanks again for, for your strong support also in yeah, diversity, equality, and inclusion. Um, and now, yeah, before presenting our first speaker, of course, I also want to give the opportunity um, to share a few words to David Pollard, the ex executive director of Workplace Pride. Thank you very much, uh, Danny, and welcome to everybody from the Workplace Pride studios here in Amsterdam. We wish that we could all be together, but uh, I think this is a wonderful that we can have this type of technology to bring us together. I, I wanted to, first of all, before I say a word about workplace pride, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, Peter said about this being a business priority. I really value that. I believe that we all value the fact that LGBTI, LGBTI inclusion in the workplace is very much a business priority for, for many organizations. And speaking of which, uh, workplace pride is, for those of you who don't know, uh, is uh, has been around for about 14 years now. We have more than 70 uh, members, multinationals, uh, governmental organizations, and academic institutions who also strive to create the best po uh, possible workplaces for LGBTI people. Now, part of the programming that Workplace Pride has, uh, has done over the years was to focus on individual groups that perhaps need a little bit of extra or want uh, a little bit of extra attention to a, sp a specific uh, group or, or topic. Uh, this started off with Women at Workplace Pride several years ago to really focus on topics that are, are unique to, to lesbians, to transgender women, and bisexual women in the workplace. Uh, this was a great success, and uh, built upon that success, we then had Young at Workplace Pride, focusing on not just young people in the workplace, but also how young people enter into the workplace. So many LGBTI students might go back into the closet uh, when they go into the workplace. And so Younger Workplace Pride works together with us and our member organizations to make sure that that doesn't happen. Our newest program is Academia at Workplace Pride, looking at faculty, students, and staff in educational institutions to make sure that inclusion for LGBTI people is also very much on the agenda. And last but certainly not least is Tech at Workplace Pride. Now I have to say that Tech at Workplace Pride has surprised me to a degree uh, because uh, it's, it's really jumped ahead as far as uh, organization is concerned and enthusiasm. Uh, and I really very much applaud what they're doing. Tech at Workplace Pride focuses on people and organizations with technical backgrounds uh, to cover topics like today on uh, artificial intelligence and many other types of topics that are interesting to our community. 
So finally, before I give it back to Danny, I'd like to thank all the people that have made this uh, possible. There's been a long time in coming this webinar, but we're, we're quite happy to have been working with many of our members, uh, individuals and organizations. And I specifically wanna thank our technical staff here. It's Bart Bartlett, who, without whom we could not have done this. And also uh, Christine Holcomb, who has been actually the spin in the web or the spider in the, in the web to help keep everything going together with workplace, with Tech at Workplace Pride and to make this event a success. So I'll give now the floor back to Danny and I wish you a good webinar. Thank you, David. And now, after all these introductions, I want to introduce Helena van der Bovenkamp, Data Privacy Officer at Saxion University of Applied Sciences, who will share some personal insights about how her second life began and how it relates to data ethics and the transgender community. Later, she will join us again for a presentation about her prof professional role as data privacy officer. But for now, the floor is yours, Helena, to share your personal story. Thank you for introducing me and thank you for letting me talk about my second life. Uh, I'm an ex-transgender, trans transgender from male to female, and you see my logo on the right side. Live your dreams, don't dream your life, and I will take you through some of my transition. Strange, sounds strange, but I'm a father of four children living in the Netherlands, uh, three male sons and one adoption daughter from China. She's already uh, becoming 18 in December this year. From origin, I am a teacher geography and, and, and uh, uh, history. Uh, I did my uh, master's at uh, modern history at the University of Nijmegen. Got the first, second and third educational degree, but when I gained my degree, there was not work available. So I uh, went on in another profession. Um, was shortly at, as uh, a communications officer at the Ministry of Defense, and I started working in the IT. When I transitioned, I was an employee of IBM. I worked there for 23 years in 16 different functions, from head of the salary admin, finance manager, resource manager, project manager, um, and at my transition within IBM, also uh, some personal items came up. I transitioned, as I, as I stated, from male to female. I was already out in social life, but not uh, as a women day to day. Um, for what I know, I'm the largest transgender you can find in the Netherlands. Uh, without wearing heels, I'm one meters and uh, 89 centimeters. I transitioned on personal items on 2012, uh, became a woman end of 2014, uh, and then started my medical transition. So I did it the other way, first became a woman and then started my transition. At the end of my transition, uh, I was uh, fully uh, transitioned to a female in 2017. Nowadays, it took uh, will take you about four till seven years to do the same transition. Uh, and I'm working, as I as stated, uh, as a data privacy officer at Saxion. I take you through some of the uh, transitioning items that you will face if you are in the transitioning. It's not obliged to make certain choices. Some, some, uh, some items are uh, rather demanded by performing uh, the transition. So what you first will have, if you go to a doctor, you get uh, you get passed through the gender clinic and then you get all kinds of uh, appointments. Those appointments are still in the administration of the medical clinic. Uh, I can still see them in, I can see the results. So that's one thing that becomes a part of your privacy is becoming privacy of the, of the hospital. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. 
After that, you get about uh, all kinds of question lists, about 1400 different questions, um, talking about your sexuality, your feelings, your personal behavior, if you did uh, uh, attempts to, to kill yourself because you are not happy with yourself. Uh, those questions are also being kept within the hospital uh, for all kinds of statistic reasons and, and investigations uh, to build up a, a broader uh, view about transgenders. And finally, if you pass all of those, you get a new document, an ID document. So you have to go to your municipality uh, where you were born. You have to go to the municipality, to the environment you're living in, and all those documents are kept as well. So there's a lot of information that is kept of you. Then you got the medical part. It's the same story. A lot of medicines uh, uh, down downgrading your your male uh, hormone, sexual uh, uh, and and sexual uh, feelings, and build up the the women with hormones. Uh, and all kinds of things are lying there. You have to go to the hospital uh, do surgery. Um, and that all is uh, being recorded and, and is being kept in the medical records. And in the end, your doctor receives a letter. And it's a part of my own letter that I have been surgeon and uh, become uh, a female in the best way that you can have. But what you can learn about this is that there are a lot of uh, items in your transition that are being recorded, being kept for all kinds of research and, and, and developments. And, and becoming uh, part of this transition, you have to be a very stable person, a strong person, and uh, be faced with a lot of questions asked. So. That was my behavior. You'll see data and ethics also from a transgender perspective are lying uh, side by side. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your personal insights and your personal story, Elena. Later, there will be time for, for, for a Q&A. And uh, yes, so, so we will see and hear you later again. But uh, thanks for now. OK, thank you. So thank you for offering me uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, in this talk, I hope to bring together a number of topics I've spent the last couple of years uh, reading a lot about uh, into what I hope will be an interesting and perhaps slightly different take on the subject uh, than you might expect from a technology and a compliance professional who works in a law firm. So. We live in interesting times at the moment uh, on a couple of fronts. Uh, firstly, from a societal perspective, there is at least uh, in the West, a greater awareness and respect uh, for gender and sexuality diversity than I can remember, at least in my lifetime. Uh, we are more and more recognizing that the world is not necessarily uh, as binary as it first appears, um, but that we all exist on many spectrums all at the same time. Secondly, uh, is humanity's ability to analyze and understand quantities and depths of information that even only a few years ago was simply impossible. I think it is hard to overstate the scale of data processing uh, in the modern world. For instance, uh, in May 2019, more than 500 hours of video were uploaded to YouTube every minute. That's almost three weeks of content being uploaded every minute of every day and that's just YouTube 18 months ago. This so-called big data is exactly that, absolutely massive data sets, most of them generated by us as we interact with the bi-directional digital world we've created. All those interactions with social media, corporate systems and departments of state are captured and logged, and more importantly, are capable of being analyzed. The essence of our complex, sometimes messy, certainly personal lives, distilled and reduced to binary ones and zeros. For the first time in human history, we have the tools and the data to analyze people to an astonishing degree. And like any tool, it's both useful and dangerous. It's this analysis of what's basically our data that gave me the title for this talk. Although I should say, I'm not the first to coin the term. I'm merely borrowing it as a useful metaphor. So 
Phrenology. Phrenology is, or rather was, a pseudoscience from the 19th century where individual characteristics of people were believed to be discernible by feeling the shapes their brains made on their skulls. That the skull, like a glove over a hand, accommodated different sizes and shapes of areas of the human brain. And that personality traits could be determined just by measuring that part of the skull that overlapped that area of the brain. So-called reading your bumps. Of course, phrenology was pure nonsense. The rigor of this practice was doubtful even back then, but it still had its proponents and believers. Phrenology emerged much like AI has at a time of rapid social and demographic change, becoming very popular in both Britain and America. It seems that people are always searching for answers when change is in the air. And so it is with big data, AI, machine learning, deep neural networks, call them what you want. It may not be a coincidence that this explosion in big data analysis has occurred at the same time as the emergence of more openness and acceptability. Perhaps this has in part been driven by some of the technological changes in how we as humans interact with each other and our drive to make connections and feel part of a group. In the process of sharing more and more information about ourselves, we've realized that we aren't alone as perhaps we thought we felt or might have been, but also that while there are others out there who share some of our feelings, desires and tastes, there are also a multitude of other ways of viewing the world. And in doing this, generating and then sharing these vast quantities of information about ourselves and the value connections we get from that, organizations, sometimes for profit, sometimes for other reasons, have realized that there is value to them too in making connections we might not have made ourselves. And with enough data, those connections can become bumps if someone looks hard enough and with enough intelligence. Connections that appear to stick out from the rest of the data and from which assumptions and more riskily, I think, conclusions are drawn. But what if those bumps are, at least sometimes, just accidents, like the shape of the skull, and not, in fact, the mind or the person underneath? I want to spend a little bit of time on AI, that application of supercomputing to colossal data sets in order to carry out a task. Tasks such as identifying that song you can't quite remember the name of using Shazam, to beat the best human player of Go, or to learn more about how the world works via climate modeling and everything in between. I'm not going to go into how this technology works. That's not the point of this. But what I will say is that AI computing is not without its risks as well as its benefits. Some of these risks are well understood, but other risks are more subtle and potentially harder to tease out. Take, for example, the connections AI makes when being trained. How can we be sure it is connecting the data in the same way we would. One way is to understand this is to ask the AI what it thinks it sees and how it uses that information to make a decision. There are a couple of examples here I think that are instructive. One is about wolves and snow, the other about dumbbells and arms. In the first example, the AI didn't learn to tell the difference between wolves and dogs because of anything particular about the animal in the photo. Instead, because it was trained on images of wolves on snowy backgrounds and dogs on grassy ones, it thought that snow was an essential quality of a wolf. And if shown a wolf on grass, it would guess wrong. In the second example, this one from Google, the engineers asked the AI what it thought dumbbells looked like. In the words of the Google engineer here, there are dumbbells in there all right, but it seems no picture of a dumbbell is complete without a muscular weightlifter there to lift it. In this case, the network failed to completely distill the essence of a dumbbell. Maybe it's just never been shown a dumbbell without an arm holding it. I'd like to think we're all a little more complex than snowy backgrounds or muscular arms when it comes to distilling our essence. Hopefully, these illustrate some of the brittleness of AI and the conclusions they can draw. They are best guesses. To be sure, they are, given enough data, extremely good best guesses, but those guesses can be based on limited data sets of internal assumptions, assumptions the people training the AI might not be able to see. Now, 
These examples are from AIs that are able to be interrogated for their decision-making logic and those errors corrected. But not all AIs are so transparent. So what lessons can we learn from the past so we're not doomed to repeat it, only this time with potentially far greater impact than what was essentially a parlor game for middle-class Victorians? I think a lot can be taken from the scientific method here. Anything that wishes to be accepted as fact, or perhaps as close as we can get to fact using this approach, needs to be repeatable. And that means by others using the same method and data to get the same answer. It also needs to be falsifiable. That is, it must be able to be disproven or contradicted by evidence. Science is also peer reviewed and shared with fellow scientists for their assessment, analysis and input. Also, and this is particularly important in the field of medicine and other sciences and disciplines, are formal ethics committees, bodies responsible for ensuring that ex the experimentation and research is done in an ethical manner and in accordance with applicable laws, etc. These committees can act as a break on potentially harmful or morally questionable techniques. Think of the ban on human cloning. Just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean we should. These committees work because they are, for the most part, open bodies whose opinions have real world effects and are observed and followed by the professions they represent. I'm not so sure the same can be necessarily said for data sciences, which are at the moment mostly closed shops, closed in the sense perhaps of commercial confidentiality and proprietary intellectual property. While there is diversity in the AI development arena, there remains a significant proportion of AI that are developed to fulfill a profit motive business need or law enforcement requirement. Facebook advertising, AI that drafts news articles, facial recognition in CCTV cameras, etc. And the organizations that develop these techniques are understandably protective of their property. The AI models developed by them to gain competitive advantage or to police us and are sometimes we're unwilling to open them up to too much scrutiny in case they lose that advantage. How might we draw these, these into any conversation on the ethics of using particular AI technology? And what would the ethics of AI even look like? There's a lot of talk of ethics frameworks and legislation at the moment, but nothing particularly official or concrete yet. Perhaps one of the first challenges yet to be overcome is simply determining which set or sets of ethics should be applied. Different countries, religions, philosophies, and with regards to this particular talk, sexualities and sexual identities all have different world views, which sometimes do not necessarily overlap as much as we might like. Coming back to medicine as, our, as my working example, this is relatively easy and hopefully non-controversial. The principle of first do no harm, or rather more accurately, within the bounds of ethical practice, doctors strive to help their patients as much as they can by recommending tests or treatments for which the potential benefit In this arena, the potential benefits of AI are currently quite well understood and an introduction of the technology, such as AI assisting in mammography assessment, is carefully and deliberately managed. This is well understood by doctor, patient and ethics committees. But how to translate that concept of more harm than good to an AI driven decision from an opaque data set? Do we risk trusting the AI and finding ourselves in a situation of the computer said so, so it must be true? I'm sure we've all heard stories of drivers blindly following the satellite navigation system into rivers or driving into cul-de-sacs and dead ends. Embarrassing situations that only affect handfuls of people at a time, sometimes with some financial cost. But what risk might there be of a flawed data model being used in the training of an AI that makes decisions about thousands or millions of people? This brings me to the next part of the talk, the question of trust. We have placed, perhaps without really knowing or understanding the potential for misuse or abuse, vast quantities of our lives onto servers run by a wide variety of organizations, each with their own motives for having this data. How much do we trust them? Beyond scientific and state-based reasons, perhaps two main motives for the collection and analysis of data, 
ideology and profit. Religious, political or other belief driven motives on one hand and on the other, perhaps more simple drive to target adverts at us to monetize our clicks. Which is worse? Which might be more harmful in the long run? I'm not sure I know, but I do know, or rather perhaps more accurately, I feel which one is potentially more risky to me at any given time. And this is, I would suggest, one of the key challenges of us to us as people. We instinctively know when something is off that we're not comfortable with or which makes us go, hmm, that's not cool. But we struggle to articulate it to anyone as fully and in the same emotional way it affects us. This innate sense of right and wrong is what makes data protection and privacy so challenging. What is reasonable to one person is another's gross invasion. And striking the balance while still trying to do good work with people's data is not to be underestimated. Coming on to perhaps something a little more concrete, there are real risks of misuse and abuse in these data sets, and not just from them being leaked or stolen, though that is a significant issue. What about the risk of inadvertent outing, even in anonymous data? The inference risk around making all those connections, the if likes this, then will like, is likely to be that, etc. Doubtless, Facebook and other social media sites I use have a pretty good portrait of me from my likes and the posts I comment on, but they still do get it wrong. Harmless enough in context, perhaps, but not if the algorithms intuit something more personal about me that is wrong. An extension of this is not just the data we generate by our likes and our posts, but information that our data is used as a proxy for. Part of the risk here is an unseen or unconscious bias in the data, such as images of wolves or wolves on snowy backgrounds, and the risk of unintentional discrimination by association. This can happen where secondary characteristics are used as proxies, which can lead to some very public problems. For example, while an insurer would not explicitly use racial characteristics in its models to weigh policy prices, analysis by neighborhood data postcodes, zip codes, etc., could result in similar discrimination for disproportionately poorer areas if populated by a high percentage of a particular ethnic group. So ho hopefully you can see that our digital footprint may extend further than we think. Doxing, that is the publishing of private identifying information by individuals, usually with malicious intent, is another real and frankly scary risk that has a long tail in the real world. Once the data has been released and picked up by motivated individuals, targeting campaigns can and do go on for years. Facial recognition is another area of potential risk for harm. Controversial studies have been carried out into whether AIs could tell someone's sexuality from their face with uncertain results. Putting aside whether it works or not, that wouldn't matter to someone motivated to use such technology to further their own prejudices. Arguments for and against facial recognition continue with the dangers of misuse being recognized and in some cases bans or moratoriums on them on it being put in place. So where does all this technological change and greater awareness of diversity get us? As a species, we've spent tens of thousands of years developing our societies at the pace our animal brains are used to, with norms being established over generations. And we adapt at that pace. Of course, sometimes large cultural and legal change does take place and take place quickly off the back of wholesale discrimination. But for the most part, it can take time for us to adapt and learn about ourselves. But that way, I think, has been superseded, and with it comes the risk of a pace of change we are not used to. The collision of openness and awareness filtered through supercomputers has the potential to be future shock writ large on whole swathes of societies at once, as well as on individuals. Do we, thanks to the technologies we now have at our disposal, risk gaining too much knowledge more quickly than we have the intellectual tools to deal with. The risk of over or misinterpreting incidences rather than genuine insights in the vast data sets at our fingertips. Correlation, 
instead of causation? Will we read the bumps and think we are seeing something unorthodox, where in fact there is nothing out of the ordinary? Seeing the shape of the skull as the answer, rather than the mind, the person that sits underneath it. For sure, our data is a valuable resource capable of helping, helping us understand ourselves. But what we are not is an inert resource there to be mined by powerful algorithms at the whim of whatever catches the fancy of the AI developer. We are the subjects of our own social experiments here. We are the ones who will bear the consequences of getting this wrong. Without a doubt, we are getting better as consumers, as citizens, as people at starting to reclaim some of our autonomy and personal agency back from these data hoarders. Changes in legislation, changes in our behavior, changes in what we will accept have begun to trim back some of the overreach and intrusion, but it is a slow process. We are the custodians, the curators of our data, and it should be up to us as to how we choose to share it and what insights can be gleaned from it. And we have the controls if we choose to use them. Use the rights that are available to us. Ask what data of ours organizations have in their possession, and more importantly, how they are using it and what bumps they think they have discovered about us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dylan. Very interesting presentation. Mike, are there any, any questions in the in the chat? Maybe while we wait, uh, Dylan, can can you share maybe one one tip what we can do as a as an individual to, to protect our data? What what would be one one thing? Yeah. So um, I, I took uh, I took about a page of notes out of my out of my talk, uh, which was all about the sort of GDPR and the uh, the regulations uh, that certainly that in Europe and other bits of the world are starting to put in place. Uh, these regulations, I think, are, are key. Uh, they give us the tools, I think, um, that, that we need to uh, ask organisations what what information they have of us. So use the right of access. Find out, um, you know, find out what organisations have got. What, what, what data they've got of it and more importantly what they're doing with it um because part of the right of access is the purpose of processing so not just what information organizations have on you or on us on all of us but what they're doing with it uh, and particularly in the context of um ai and um uh, in the gdpr there's the there's the general prohibition on um automated decision making and profiling now you know there's there's, there's in there's talk about you know we we've all consented to this stuff but um i i would suggest you know use use the rights that are available to us in the regulations start asking these questions uh you know asking what people have got and what they're doing with it um in the chat yeah we have questions popping up right now i think people have been digesting the uh, the heaviness of the presentation which was great um martin says we see nowadays that our online collected data is being used to feed us online whatever we want to hear, the rabbit hole effect, he says. Mm. Uh, due to this, there's a risk that one can get stuck in their own reality bubble while the real reality is damaged or hidden. Um, how can we help prevent such a, a risk that is going to end up ruling the world, essentially, he asks. So um, that's a great question. Um, and again, something I, I've kind of considered myself. Um, you know, I, I have my Facebook feeds set up how I like them. Uh, you know, and I do worry sometimes that um, it'll just become a little bit of an echo chamber. Um, I, 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 I'm going to quote something I read somebody else say, um, you know, maybe look at contrary points of view um in 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 these in these platforms you know the, the the diversity of human experience and human expression is there um and you know go go out and have a look and see what other people are thinking what other people are saying um now that can sometimes be a little bit challenging particularly um you know in some of the more extreme ends of uh the viewpoints that are available online um but yeah, I, you know, um, try not to fall into um, fall down rabbit holes. Recognize perhaps that um, you know what you're being shown is perhaps what you're being fed rather than um, you know what you necessarily want to see. So um, always try and stretch and reach out. You know, we we have 
uh, I mean, the internet is such an amazing resource. Uh, we have you know, more information at our fingertips than we've ever, ever had um, as people. Um, and the only thing I suppose stopping us from finding out is ourselves. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we've got time for just one more question. Uh, okay. Bram from Arcadius asks, how can we collect diversity data to measure progress while at the same time safeguarding everyone's privacy and safety? <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, well, indeed. Um, so, I mean, this, this is something that, um, you know, we, we, we see at, at Clifford Chance. Um, you know, I sit in, I sit in the privacy team. Uh, these, these, this is a question that comes across our, uh, comes, comes across my desk all the time. Um, and uh, there's no single answer, I'm afraid. Um, I suppose, if possible, anonymous data, first and foremost. Um, you know, if, if the data can be anonymized, then absolutely it should be. You know, we're not being able to identify individuals uh, in, in, in the information. Um, transparency, you know, why why is this information being asked for? That that goes a long way, I think. Um, you know, if, 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 if organizations are trying to understand the diversity of, of either the population or their customer base, be upfront with people as to why you're collecting this data. Don't kind of, oh, hang on, we've got all this interesting data we can do something with. No, 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 you know, you, you collect that for some other reason. Go back, ask the people, be upfront with them, be honest. Uh, and you'll probably get a, a more positive engagement. You know, if people are, um, if they don't think it's, if they can sit there and go, hmm, I'm cool with that, then, you know, you'll get a better response. Yes, th thanks, Dylan, for your responses. Uh, okay. if, if you if you want uh, to also answer more questions in, in the in the chat, feel free to do so. Th but yeah. uh, for now, thanks, Dylan, for for your presentation. You no, know, thank you very much. If uh, if you attended the webinar that we hosted uh, back in May, then you will be familiar with our next speaker. I'm happy to again be able to announce Dr. Willeke Slingerland. Professor of Applied Research for Resilient Democracy from the Saxion University of Applied Sciences, who will today stimulate a sense of collective responsibility for the long-term ethical implications of the way data is collected and used. Willeke, please go ahead and share your insights with us. Thank you, Danny, for the introduction. And I've already really appreciated the previous speaker's point of view, and I think there's so much important things to say about the ethical dimensions of uh, data technology. So I hope to contribute uh, to that myself. Um, and I have different reasons for finding this very important. And, and foremost, it's because I work with students on a daily basis, students from the Netherlands, but also from across uh, the world. And of course, we've seen how they sometimes suffer from their non-inclusive uh, countries and that they can be afraid to be who they want to be. So that is why I think it's very important that we continue to have this dialogue and press for this important matter in a time when data is everywhere and not always for the good uh, cause. So, um, and I also, the other aspects of course is working with, um, with within education. I hope that we can all this, this perspective which has been shared also by Dylan in the previous presentation that actually we can uh, change the curricula in such a way that this awareness of how AI is working, even for the lawyers or the non-lawyers or the non-data scientists uh, programs, that we are aware of what data actually is doing and how we contribute to the ethical awareness uh, by working with, with data ourselves. So uh, that's why I'm very happy to uh, briefly con contribute to this uh, very important webinar. So I will focus on the collective responsibility because I think that this topic of um, data ethics um, should be addressed by looking at what we actually do and can do together. So I um, will start, of course, by, by uh, stressing that technology in itself, and this is something which even from a law point of view, has always been difficult to fully grasp what technology uh, means, data technology, um, but that the possibilities that for the community has have been great. So at the initial uh, introduction of, of data technology, while it was the internet at the time, but also the digital platforms which arose over the years, it was great because the community itself, of course, felt less isolated. There were 
even uh, it could be used to to show concrete forms of, of violations of LGBTI plus rights. And of course, we can connect uh, beyond the borders of our country. So again, very important, but with every good cause, of course, you can see also the, the negative side of the coin. So um, that's why we should think about the terms of collective responsibility. And I guess the corona crisis in itself, the COVID-19, has again um, made us think about what do we share in terms of data? How far should governments use our data to prevent the pandemic to, to increase? And um, I've put down some of the headlines from um, newspapers from 2017, but even the recent ones, uh, which you probably heard about Uber, uh, in which you could see actually, again, that although um, data technology can be used for the good cause, there are so many horrific examples in which data was leaked, data was misused, data was manipulated. Um, for example, how you can see uh, in, in times of, it's a third headline, uh, at the time of South Korea, that um, when Asia was already suffering from Corona, from COVID-19, and they were using data technology to see the track and trace, where were people actually uh, meeting, so to see where could we actually see clusters of COVID arise, that some of the clusters were linked to nightclubs, which again fueled homophobia. So something which you could say is um, for the good cause was invented actually backfired extremely for the community. Um, more recently, I mean, Dylan, very, very interesting what you described about the possibilities of AI and the human being within AI. Um, we've seen the recent court cases. Um, there were many in the Netherlands uh, in terms of uh, predictive profiling by our tax authority but also Uber, which is an ongoing law case in which uh, um, automatic decision-making was used to fire uh, drivers, Uber drivers. So there was not a human um, uh, description anymore that the AI was actually deciding uh, on all this data and what actually were the poor drivers and which were the drivers which did not function well. So there's a lot of laws, law and court uh, decisions being made. So it helps us probably to understand what are the boundaries of AI. But nevertheless, I have a look at background myself. I can see that technology uh, develops so fast that we also need to think about the morality because the morality at the end is the basic thing which should be assessed. But this needs to be practiced by all of us too. Uh, and I think Dylan already mentioned what kind of ethical framework should be used and what should be included. So hopefully we can uh, have some steps in, in that direction. Um, so in, in the past years, privacy was still um, considered to be a personal, one-dimensional, I only you know, store or use my data one time. It was used privacy um, from a legal perspective. Um, and I guess we all, as we are here today, but I mean, our society uh, is now finally understanding that privacy is, uh, or privacy is, is a far-reaching, multi-dimensional, multi-usage uh, phenomenon, which should be included or responded to with an ethical perspective. So although privacy laws are there and the GDPR is very important, and it, it does also discuss topics like uh, predictive profiling and automatic decision-making, nevertheless, uh, the morality of things uh, should be included because Again, the technology moves faster than the actual law can uh, can be written. So um, this is a big shift in terms of, of how we regard privacy. Um, and already, Dylan, you mentioned the uh, face profiling. Um, indeed, at, the, at, at all levels, the data technology is used. So um, the sensors, the Internet of Things, the algorithms, the next generation networks um, used to far reaching events. Um, with the uh, gay uh, experience, with the gay face recognition as an extreme example of are we actually have, heading in a direction that we have become what the AI is telling that we are. So the human being behind this all is, is very important. But I'm thinking about who's actually providing this data, who's working with this data, processing this data. And that's where the aspect of collective responsibility comes into place. So it's about identifying roles and responsibilities. And of course, most of the privacy regulations do share or at least describe some of the, the roles which need to be distinguished. 
but nevertheless, I think it's very isolated um, if we talk about the processor or the registrator, um, because as we, Saxion University of Applied Sciences, we are part of a con research consortium which is uh, named the Data Tills. And this is a very important research group because there's not only academia from across the uh, uh, Netherlands, but also companies and, uh, or well, stock uh, listed uh, big firms, I should say, uh, and governmental organizations are part of this to discuss what is technically possible and what are the ethical boundaries. So we actually meet now and then to have a time to reflect, to use our own and others' perspective to see where are we heading at. And this is a very important time for me because that we do this voluntarily, uh, but this gives us the possibility to make steps in the direction of collective responsibility to guarantee data ethics. Because too often cases like Uber, uh, but also the case with the tax authority uh, recently, uh, too often people who were involved, individual uh, professionals who work with the data, I always refer to them as the one who answers the phone as a call center as the employee until the CEO. Everybody should have fulfill a role and be responsible in working in the right way with the data. But who is actually responsible for the entire picture with how the data is used? And too often people will pinpoint at one another um, and say, well, actually that was a compliance officer or the privacy officer, or it was the one who actually, uh, well, produced the data. And this is a too isolated way of, of looking at responsibility. So how should we uh, continue with working on this collective responsibility? Well, by at least understanding that privacy equal to COVID-19 is, is one of the most focus points for today, are complex system issues. So it's a wicked problem. Um, privacy data uses um, it's similar to, to uh, the pr privacy uh, situation is that none of the specific interests are absolute. Everything is interdependent. We do not know what the future will be like. So there is a bit of fog, a big bit of mist, uh, which we should try to distinguish what is actually the right route. So too often, and we saw that in COVID-19, I, I was also part of a panel um, on the Dutch Corona app to track and trace um, the contacts. Um, and there was a lot of, lot of research by, by scientists to, to, of course, guarantee this, the privacy part of this Corona app. Uh, but nevertheless, in every discussion we had, you could actually see that short-term fear when the pandemic was at the heat of its moment in the first wave, actually blurs the long-term effects. So uh, the, the direct safety, uh, the, the, the way hospitals were crowded with, with people uh, actually makes, us, it makes it impossible to really take some time to, to go back to, to do some critical thinking and seeing what are the long-term effects. So in that sense, COVID-19 um, is a metaphor, you could say, is a way of, of of thinking about privacy in, in a data-driven or data-centered society as we uh, as we have become. So um, this long-term way of thinking is something which is quite difficult for us human beings. But nevertheless, I hope that we, as we are here today, but also from Saxion, as we work with students, which are the professionals of the future, that we actually help them to think in terms of systemic wicked problems thinking with a long-term vision. Uh, and of course, you might have heard about the Blur Blurbany uh, case. So although we, uh, most of us in the, in the recent past, thought about privacy as a personal thing, and we, we, we general, generally think about uh, and, and rephrase to, to statements like, I have nothing to hide, or it's for the good cause. And again, we've seen it with the Corona uh, uh, Track and Trace app or especially coming from the Netherlands, I trust my government, so I do not mind that my data has been collected or that they actually ask why I am, my age, when was I born, my sexuality and so forth. Um, so, but also the general belief that data are protected. And al although it's very good that you are, if you're from a high trust society, that you think all these things and that you trust anonymization and Dylan also referred to it, nevertheless, um, that's why I think Germany is such a great uh, case coming from a, a democ democracy, a, a developed country. But nevertheless, you see so many difficulties in, in Germany to get 
um, uh, things um, collected in terms of data. Uh, we've seen in 2010 when uh, Google tried to introduce a street view that so many Dutch municipalities asked to be blurred, so their houses had to be blurred. So if you see that Google street view map, actually Germany was becoming totally blurred. So because they have noticed how a to total set of collecting data, how a data print, um, of course, in the times of, of, of Stasi, how actually data, personal data, could actually be a matter of life and death at the time. And before that, of course, in the Second World War. So our, from being a Dutch person myself, our neighboring country has a completely different outlook on privacy as, as we, as the Netherlands. And that's something which is so interesting because they have gone through processes and, and have seen how data collection could backfire. Um, so all these arguments on the left-hand side, which we still hear, I think we should always try to, to, to also give uh, those who actually express these statements the other side of the coin and say, okay, it's, it's good that you are a positive person and you will feel protected and blah, 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 blah. Nevertheless, be aware of that. And this means that this person, all of us, have a, also a very strong responsibility to consider, okay, how to proceed from here. Um, so, um, in terms of this data-based governance, which is, is part of today's discussion that we, we some of us have, have, who have a negative point of view think that, yeah, the, the rabbit hole metaphor was, was being used. So is every data uh, a, a risk in itself? And, and are we becoming a totally data-centered governance and are all checks and balances, media, uh, social media, is everything being driven by data, which in itself is, uh, is, is, is based on, on manipulation or censorship or, or uh, AI. So uh, from our research group on, on resilient democracy, of course, um, we should be aware that um, privacy now is a general interest. And that's something which you cannot say often enough. So it's not a personal issue anymore. It's a general interest which we should uh, frame like that. So it has far reaching implications. Um, for the, our democratic rights and principles. Um, and we should be aware that all these uh, policies are designed and rules are being made and, and laws are enforced by using this data. So there's no way that we actually will have a, have a, a stop and, and say that this we go back to the old fashioned way of, of governing our country. So taking that in consideration that this is the new normal, uh, then we should very much invest in collective responsibility in terms of data ethics, because otherwise it will be a threat to uh, all legal principles, which we should observe in our democracy and rule of law. So um, the analogy between privacy and, and data technology on the one hand and COVID on the other hand, um, we should be aware that these are complex systems working. So although we, and, and Dylan already mentioned the way we think as human beings, too often when, when decisions need to be made or we try to, to do interventions in whatever sort of topics, we consider it things to be causal links. So our traditional thinking, our first system of brains which we use is still thinking A leads to B. While our society as it is today, on whether it's climate change or whether it's poverty or obesity or it's COVID-19 or privacy, all are complex system issues. So this means that our way of thinking, understanding, our way of education should be totally uh, well uh, reformed in that sense that system thinking should be an edu any form of education so we should be aware that everything we see is always more than some of the elements and that elements interact so a small change in one system if, if we in terms of data sets can affect entire systems and that's something we've seen in the tax authority case when algorithms were used to prevent fraud from happening. And they just indicated like dual nationality, just make that an indicator to see fraud. And it backfired. Huge amount of, 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 of people were, uh, well, being part of the profiling process and, and there are huge court cases going on. And this has far reaching impl implications on personal lives. People died because of that. People committed suicide because of that. And of course, the entire system is being undermined because if we see that our, our government is using this 
AI in the right in the wrong way, this undermines everything we've we've built up in our democracy. So system thinking is very important. So um, seeing relations, seeing structures, see the interrelatedness between all of these. And this is why we as Saxion are part of this data tales, to make sure that we do not only have our blind spots ourselves. So going to the main topic of my presentation today, the collective response. So if we think about collective responsibility, um, already mentioned the, the multiple perspective aspect, but first of all, we should recognize our own biases as human being. And who am I addressing? Well, actually everybody, because it's the, those who work for, for uh, governments and, and organizations answering the phone, talking to clients, patients, citizens, um, um, filling in data, to those who work with the data, like many of you are here today, data scientists, to those, the CEOs who have to be responsible in terms of compliance and corporate social responsibility. So each individual should be aware and uh, too often have to tell that also to politicians that you have your own biases. So recognize your own biases uh, when, when working with, with data. Um, but also being aware of defining moments because many of the cases, and I, I the cases of Uber and the case of the Dutch tax authority, there were individuals who were aware that something was wrong, that the AI was not doing what it was supposed to do, that people who should not be um, um, screened in, in terms of being a fraudster were um, still being uh, arrest and addressed and being part of, of, of uh, uh, investigation scheme. And then it all goes to culture. So the culture of being being aware, being open to, to talk and, and addressing possible bias in AI. And they were not heard. So the leadership, moral culture is very important in, the, in this sense as well. So where are your checks and balances internally? And not only in the formal roles people have, but also those operational wide to work with it, who might think and come across things which are, well, uh, negative and which are a threat to, to the way data technology is used. So these defining moments when somebody's coming and asking you a question and, or just asking a question which might not be um, a, a, pr a pretty one because it might be inconvenient or it might be a form of criticism, always be aware that this is a time when you can actually learn, reflect or have some time to, uh, well, to do take some action before things escalate. And this goes to the heart of my background, the integrity of, of organizations. So um, two of the things apart as collective responsibility. Um, the other things is, of course, that we as, as, as individuals and as a collective should also uh, distinguish facts from assumptions. Um, I too often work with, with politicians and, and rule makers, and they so often refer to, uh, to well, facts which are in fact assumptions. So the quality of conversation, the quality of evidence, this is something um, which because of time pressure or because of we are so uh, used to working within our own social networks, we, we find difficult to actually open up and to think differently. And I guess that's the whole idea about the community as we have it here today, that all this diversity is, is such an important way to make sure that nobody has this tunnel vision, that we are aware that every angle or perspective has something to add to this. So that's very important as well. Um, and that, of course, is related to the, to the fourth uh, aspect, to involve this multiple perspective. Um, and inclusiveness, again, I see too often that, that decision makers or law enforcement ag agencies find it difficult to, to organize this. They, they try to do it in a very, well, artificial way because uh, they, they think it, there should be a different uh, uh, process or procedure for that. Well, if you actually look around, there's so much the perspectives to gain from uh, in, in the proximity. Um, so if this becomes the new normal with working with data, so if, if we ask ourselves what are facts, what is evidence, what is some form of criticism, how should this help us, our organization, to reorganize itself or to reflect or to amend certain procedures? Um, how should we test certain um, technology, what is technology uh, possible by asking others, young people, elder people, people in the community. So this diversity in part of, of, of uh, co-decision making. 
So that's a very important aspect in terms of collective responsibility. And um, also, like I said, all of us, uh, we, we should distinguish the short term and long term. That's very important. Too often data is, is, is considered to be the perfect solution to an issue we have now. But going back to the German case, um, we've seen uh, that in, in the sale case with the Corona app more recently, um, that it can backfire. So can we actually, in this collective setting, as an organization or even beyond the borders of organization, can we actually show that we discuss this aspect of long-term and, and short-term effects of our current decision, how we're using the technology? Um, and maybe an, an open door, so to speak, but too often the collective responsibility, if people adopt it, they find it difficult to, to, to address it. So um, that's when we, when we work in the Data Tales Consortium with these companies and with these organizations, we, we, we actually say, do not only uh, depend on your compliance officer or on your privacy officer or on your CEO. It's a matter of collective responsibility. So each of us is working or making, working, processing data for certain services or for whatever cause. Actually, are we all, we are collective responsibility to make it in such a way that ever the services get better, but that it is also respecting the very important public values like integrity and inclusiveness. So um, collective responsibility in that sense is something which we should refer to in every meeting and every, so not going back to isolated causal thinking to pinpoint that individual responsibilities because the times have changed. That's no longer of use. Um, so basically that's my wrap up um, for uh, today. So um, my final phrase is that, so we need to learn from complex systems um, in the past to decide on complex phenomena in the future. And I guess COVID-19 has, well, um, stressed the importance of that. Thank you. That was my contribution to today's discussion. Thank you so much for, for your interesting presentation and for, for a different angle on, on the topic. Um, Mike, do, do we have any questions from, from the audience? Hello, hi. Uh, yes, we have um, some very sort of real world perspective on uh, the Corona Melda app. And first of all, we've had questions. Do you recommend using the app? And also secondarily, um, do you think it's, uh, it's, some, it's, it's an app that could be networked internationally? And what are the, the, the positives and negatives of that? Mm -hmm. And also, finally, also on the Corona Melda app, um, you use the app and you sign up and then Bluetooth gathers info from nearby other people. And then you set permissions that give away, you know, a certain level of data and, and information and privacy, etc. Do you think there are problems with that? Is it a one way street? Once you give those permissions, is it, is it hard to revoke those permissions and then regain your privacy? Mm -hmm. So all yeah. about the Corona Melda app. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank so you. So in, indeed, the Corona app, we were one of the last countries in the Netherlands uh, to actually introduce the Corona app because we were so sensitive about the privacy uh, aspect. And I'm, I must underline that I, I'm not technically uh, as aware as, as you are, but I've listened to those from the technical point of view who, who worked on it. And um, I'm convinced that it's a safe uh, app. And I downloaded myself. So I, I, after a while, when I when I saw all the, well, the notes, uh, behind the app uh, when we discussed all the final pinpoints in terms of, well, you, you mentioned the Bluetooth and so forth. I was convinced that it was useful uh, to use it. Um, so that's why I downloaded it. So, um, so far I have not, not had any notifications so far. Um, the question in terms of should there be a European one? Um, yes, of course, I think that's also very important in terms of, of COVID-19. We, we, we see that it doesn't stop at the border. It, it's a global issue and the global mobilization actually increases the pandemic. Um, in my ideal world, of course, we would have a European app, um, but nevertheless, I, uh, this has so many risks, uh, so many different, well, legal, ethical frameworks uh, be between countries that I personally would do, would not like to see it being connected to, for example, um, some of the southern or eastern countries, because some of their regimes, we already know that they, um, 
are not the ones who, who lead by uh, example in terms of democracy. So that's a very sensitive issue. So I'm not pinpointing it in individual countries. Um, from a practical point of view, we also realized that the way data is collected there and our whole social security system and health system is, is established, it's difficult to, uh, to um, use this track and trace system if the other frameworks um, are not the same. But in the ideal world, of course, yeah, yeah, I, I would I would like to see it, but for two various two different reasons, I would say no. Thanks for for your perspective, Felicke. Uh Yeah, th thanks again for your presentation. I think there are more questions in the chat, so if if you yeah. want to answer them, please please do so in in, in the chat box. Okay, thanks, thank Felicke. you very much, Danny. I will. So now, after one personal story and two presentations. Uh, I would like to break it up a bit and hand over the word to Maureen uh, Swanheit uh, from Arcardis and Martijn van den uh, Tillard from RSML, who will now be collect, uh, conducting a small poll with you. And then after you submitted your answers, then I also want uh, to invite you to maybe stretch your legs a bit, uh, get a glass of, wa uh, glass of water um, before we present them the results. Let's start with uh, question one. What is the first word that pops into your mind when you think about using your uh, LGBTI plus related data in the in the cloud? I'm actually surprised by the diversity of the answers because we split them up a little bit in the, uh, the more positive and a more negative way. And I see that we are very, very divided on this, which I can imagine because yeah, you never know how we can use this data in a positive or a negative way. Maureen, what do you have? Uh, to add to let's go over to yeah well as i see yes also mostly scary and maybe a little bit uh yeah um well not disappointed but uh if it could be used in the right way then it should be all be well in my positive uh future be useful so uh mm -hmm. well but good good that we had this uh outcome to see that people still find it scary to uh, include their data into the cloud um, that actually also shows for the next question that there it also goes a little bit towards, um, yeah, maybe the same as in it's a little bit scary or at least rich data would you never want to disclose in online. And here I first saw it coming up a little bit with religion. But uh, we ended with as well sexual orientation. So that comes a little bit together with, um, yeah, using your LGBTI related data in the cloud. I think uh, even it's even more scary than uh, sharing your uh, religious data. So um, yeah, that again says a lot, I guess. Yeah, indeed. I. Uh... I saw in a, in a question or response in the chat, uh, maybe somebody does not have any troubles disclose any of this data online. We didn't uh, put that action uh, option in the in the questions. But indeed, it's interesting to see that that uh, we throw everything uh, all over the place online quite often. Um, makes you think if we should keep doing that as people in general. Yeah. But then if we go to the next question. Yes, has information regarding your gender identity or sexual orientation ever been used while uh, making travel plans? Um, yeah, we put this question in the poll because of the next speaker, which is Amon from, uh, from Booking. We were wondering if this is actually something that people look at, because myself, um, you could consider that you don't feel comfortable traveling to a country where um, being gay is punishable by death or something like that. So I was kind of wondering how everybody looks at it, but most people I see have never um, experienced this and only three people in a negative way. So I'm very interested now how, uh, how this can be used in a positive way or prevented uh, in a negative way by, by, for example, our next speaker. Marine? Yeah. Yes, well, it's good to see that it's more in a positive way that uh, people see in this way it's being used uh, well and not uh, going back to the next uh, the, fo um, fo the two questions beforehand where it was a uh, all a little bit more scary. 
Um, and then we go a little bit more forward towards uh, organizations. And if your organization would have self-ID available to collect LGBTI data to improve their uh, inclusion policy, would you feel comfortable to privately self-ID? Well, I think in a company, people feel much more safe than it's when it's just, uh, just somewhere online. And um, I think most of the people, uh, yeah, are are feeling free to to do so, and maybe they are also already doing so. But uh, yeah, I think uh, the company is then probably a, a safe space with less risks. Um, well, uh, this was uh, what we have seen till now in the in the in the poll. So uh, yeah, Danny, let's go back to you. Thank yeah. you. Th thanks for for showing us the results. Really interesting to, to see. And uh, as you already said, yeah, right, the, the, the third question is really uh, going now also um, to the next topic. So I'm happy to, to introduce uh, Amon Verster, who is the Marketing Director, Suppliers and Industry at Booking.com. And within his capacity as a market, Marketing Director, Amon is being able to not only market the platform, but he's also responsible to ensure that Booking.com lives up to the expectations of, of customers across a wide range of data topics and data ethics. Amon, the floor is yours. Thanks, Danny, and hello, uh, everyone. Um, so I titled this presentation today, Our Journey to Create a Proud Platform. Um, but before I start to talk about this, I'd like to start uh, with a little bit of uh, recognition. So I'm super fortunate that I exist in a company that has such an extremely active, uh, proud community. Uh, and I know uh, that many of those people are dialing in and tuning in today. And, and I just wanna say without the Be Proud community that is at the core of Booking and the work that they have done over the last five years, which is not their core role, uh, we simply wouldn't have had the foundations to be sharing the story that I share with you today. And so, for everyone that's tuning in from the community, I, I wanna start uh, with recognition for that and thank you for continuing to strengthen those foundations uh, through the work that, that you're doing. So I start with an image and, and this image for me uh, represents reflection and uh, we are passing our one year anniversary of the Travel Proud journey. And as you pass an anniversary, I think it's a great chance for you to look back. And I've decided to do that look back uh, at today's uh, session. Uh, and there are three reflections uh, for me that are most prominent in my thinking, particularly when I think about the theme that's been set uh, for this Tech at Workplace um, uh, virtual meeting. And the first reflection is the data uh, that we had at Booking didn't explicitly inform the Travel Proud program or the opportunity. I think our program was initiated from a genuine moment of cultural reflection and human insight. And then I think the third reflection that I have is in our case, I think Travel Proud is an example of where we've demanded our tech and data to help and solve a real travel pro problem. And so what I hope to show you through the course of this presentation is that human insight, uh, cultural reflection, it, it simply plays a critical role in informing any tech evolution today and, and towards the future. But perhaps I start with talking about how we talk about our company and, and, and you know, our business is very simple. If anybody ever asks me to draw it, I, I basically draw it in three parts. Of course, it's a lot more complex than that, but I think it's a good grounding in terms of the, the dynamics of our company. And so when I think about it, we optimize uh, on a daily basis uh, to reach millions of users across country and language who, who want to get out and experience the world. And we bring them to, to our store, which is a large travel marketplace, and it's facilitating huge amount of, of transactions, primarily on, on accommodation. But we also have relationships with millions of supply partners around the world. Think about big hotels, think about vacation rentals, but also think about um, our casual hosts who rent out their, their property for, for six weeks during uh, the summer. And throughout all three parts of our business, we engage with and use consented data to support making decisions. And we really do talk about how data drives almost every decision that we make uh, about our business. 
But funnily enough, if you came into booking and you spoke to people at booking, what they would say is that our, our world is not three boxes, is not about using consented data. They would tell you that we are all about making it easier for everyone to experience the world, which I think is interesting. And I think it's important for the purposes of this that I'm really clear on, on, on kind of my belief that being data led alone as a business or human insight led alone will not initiate the tech evolution that we will see in the coming years. I think it's focusing on the relationship between these two elements that will drive the next significant evolution. And I think our relationship should be about demanding data and tech to truly work to serve real human and societal opportunities. And I also don't think I'm alone in that thinking. And I thought it might be interesting to illustrate that. So I'm going to give you a little uh, challenge and I'm going to show you ultimately six missions. Each one represents a global company. And so you've got three to start with in column uh, A. Unlock the potential of human creativity. Organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And then the last one, give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. Let me show you three more. Now, these ones are a bit longer, so I'm just going to let you just read. Now, think about how you would describe the difference in the companies that exist in each column. So what typifies the companies in column A and what typifies the companies in column B? By now, hopefully some of you may have spotted it. You probably have guessed who the companies are. That's a, a sub game that you can play. But column A are companies whose value, the majority valuation of the company comes from data or creating value through data. And the second is value through goods. And I put a bit of a curveball on the last one in column B uh, because you were starting to see some shifts are happening within those. And I will leave you to continue the game of guessing the companies. But I think the reason I show it and illustrate it is I think we're seeing more businesses, more companies recognize this direction. Ensuring that there's 100% clarity, which is essentially what a mission does for a company, that the direction of the business is to take human, cultural, societal inputs and use data and technology to serve those opportunities. And through this, I think some of these companies are significantly evolving tech. I will not uh, uh, comment on the quality of that evolution, but you are seeing evolution. So then let me take you into the booking context and I will show you uh, the booking mission 10 years ago when I was in the company at that time. And I flash you forward to 2020, which is our most recent version. And I think what you see is it is much more rich with that human uh, lens, that insight. And actually, what's quite interesting is the change in, in to the latest mission, the one that you see in 2020, is a single word that we changed. And we had a couple of evolutions between them. And that word was everyone. Because that word forces you as an organization and forced us as an organization to have a real moment of reflection. Simply, we said, can we really live up to the word everyone? And I think as an organization, we started to uh, investigate that more and look at that through the lens of the LGBTQ plus travel community. And as I said, we're data led. So you are seeing a typical set of user needs. It's fairly predictable with the prioritization of functional fixes. In addition, we did a lot of uh, customer data. You know, we know that by 2030, 180 million travelers will identify as being part of the LGBTQ plus travel community. We know, for example, that 52% of Gen Z identify as something other than 100% straight. We know 54% of millennials and Gen Z know someone who uses a pronoun other than he or she. And we also asked our community to tell us what we needed to do. And what is staggering was there was a need for core functional fixes, but actually what was the most staggering piece of data was a more human-led data, which was one in three LGBTQ plus travelers fear judgment from hotel staff when traveling. And while that data is insightful, and you can certainly build a solid business case to do something around it, I think it misses on a key element. I think what it failed to show is the 
uh, is what LGBTQ plus travelers feel. And so I want to show you a short video that I know we're going to queue up now to show that level of insight. Take it away. The most annoying thing staying in hotels is feeling unsafe, having to correct people about traveling with your partner. Despite your research, you still go in and you find that people make odd comments. Disdain, disgust, ignoring you is the nicest way. It's just like you don't exist. The waiter addresses my partner as sir, and it was deliberate. The initial check-in and the conversation of, are you sure you want a double room? <laughs> well, you're, you're two women. Yeah, is that all right? Because we're in the 21st century. I think hotel people can be quite judgy sometimes. <laughs> if you're a hotel, I think you should be aware of the nearest LGBTQ bar, or restaurant, or like a hangout or something like that. As much as you would be telling someone to know where the nearest museum was. If I'm booking a hotel, I would like to see if you accept me. Just like, I want to feel that I can be safe. So I've seen that um, uh, video a couple of times in, in the time that I've been running this program and it still has the same effect every time on me, um, that was video. Um, and so, you know, what became really obvious is that the data was hiding some real gaps that existed in our business. And I think when we brought the data together with this insight, we were able to build or start to build the Travel Proud plan, not around a single set of data, but we rallied around four traveller realities. And those are the four traveler realities that I think you heard overlay, the data supports it, and they became our uh, mini missions. So I think if we're fairly well published to be relatively good at optimization, right? And we use, as I said previously, data and tech is the basis to do that. And you see lots of examples that I've highlighted on a given uh, hotel page, uh, how we kind of go and uh, do that. Uh, whether that is uh, getting partners to work with us, whether it's how we merchandise content, uh, whether it is uh, offering flexibility, for example, there's lots of different ways that we do that. And we experiment heavily on that using A-B testing at the core. And it's brought us a lot of consumer satisfaction and success for many years. But I ask a question for you on the call. If you think about our optimization, who would you ascertain with all this experimentation, all these years that our platform is uh, optimized for? Well, what we saw was our platform was optimized for the general user, a couple visiting a city for a weekend. Um, and that serves you know, a significant travel base, but it certainly did not live up to the world, to the words everyone. So now we had another moment of reflection. I come back to that page and we reflected that the reality is in a normal search that our technology and our data was not working to serve LGBTQ plus travelers. There was not a single piece of data that lived up to those expectations or those needs. So we embarked on developing the program and we call it, we have different uh, uh, names for it, but we have Book Proud and Book Proud is all about making sure that our product is inclusive at its core. That's doing things like updating 200 or over 200 guest and partner facing communication templates. We're currently pioneering how we will be inclusive in over 42 languages. Our Proud Hospitality Pillar is our leading education program. So we deliver an education program at no cost to our accommodation partners. And our aim is to help them deliver inclusive hospitality because I believe inclusive hospitality is the only hospitality. And in a few short months, we have had over 500 properties graduate from that program. So really big milestone uh, that we hit this week. We have our proud certified work and that's really how we're better surfacing these proud certified properties, right? These graduated properties and this change is pending to go live in the coming days on our platform that will allow you to find those properties and recognize them on the platform. And then Travel Proud is really all about our integrated customer communications program. And you will see more of that in 2021. And we uh, intended in 2020, but certainly in 2021 to mark the start of our journey publicly. Uh, and that's aligned with our role as general sponsor of Amsterdam Pride. But ultimately, the big win, uh, sorry, ultimately throughout rolling, with rolling out these initiatives was our data and technology 
did not have what it was needed to serve or inform the experience, which is curious, right? We couldn't just go to the data or the technology. We had to do the training and certify the properties. We had to work through language to, to give that to our systems to be able to surface the inclusive experience. And so I think it's an example of where we've worked with our tech to give it better inputs, whether that's also giving our, our partners around the world um, all of the skills that they need to play a big role in that experience. So it really is going through end-to-end uh, -end, all of the pieces that will have an impact on the end user. So in the coming days, as an LGBTQ plus traveler, you may find yourself on a simple page of properties where you absolutely know that when you arrive, you will be able to show up as all of yourself. But what it really is, is a product of a team of people that have taken human insights, rallied around traveler realities, and then proactively pushed through and demanded that our technology evolves to live up to these expectations and make a difference. And in one year, we have managed to translate human insight into business priorities. We've worked to inform new data sets that can be used. We are supporting millions of partners from a hospitality experience. And we're really excited that we're going to be able to surface for the first time this dedicated experience via our city pages uh, and much more uh, to come. So hopefully you get an example on this reflection. And if I come back to my reflection is that we've changed the relationship that we've had uh, to serve the LGBTQ plus travel community. And I think it's an example of the ultimate meeting of heart and head to have an impact. I'm super proud of the work that the, the team have done um, and how we've really put kind of our tech to the test and the test to live up to our mission and that really important word, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Aman. Very interesting presentation and really nice to see what you did to, yeah, to make the, the platform more inclusive and maybe also more, more safe for, for the LGBT plus community. So really, thanks. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box and uh, maybe Amon can, can find the time to answer them there. But in the interest of time, I want to yeah, now uh, again uh, give the word to, to Helena van der Bovenkamp, Data Privacy Officer at uh, Saxon University of Applied Sciences, to conclude our series of presentations for today. In her role as a Data Privacy Officer, Helena has insights on a lot of data streams and processes. And sometimes this can strike ethics and confidentiality. Helena, please give us a small overview of today's reality and how it matters for the LGBT plus community. What I will do is give you a, sh a short orientation on data and ethics, some theory, something that we experience in reality and let people give some insight in what to share ourselves and see what is being done and being processed within Saxion. Privacy is uh, quite quite old. Uh, as you can see, Aristotle has wrote it uh, 2,500 years ago. Every human being has a right to change, has his rights to um, to privacy. So it's not from the beginning that we are uh, struggling with this feature, but we do this for quite a, a while. Um, and you can sell, ask yourself a lot of questions. Uh, what do we process? Who do we process about? And how do we do that? And which question do we, do we ask? And which answers can we give? If you pick up a modern telephone, then you can see what's in there already. Yeah? And what, I, what I see as a privacy officer, sometimes pe people uh, lose their, their uh a telephone or it is being stolen and a lot of data is being on the street if not protected in the right way so we share from our own perspective a lot of data with the outside world and we live in quite a rich world and we don't oversee all our data that's being processed from our perspective over the world something is being hit on the left uh, hand and is being processed on the right hand, but we don't even see that. A little bit of theory that you can collect data on the based on the on the argument what's legal 
uh, you can also think from a perspective what's ethical, okay? what's rare, what's fair, what's just. But there is a, a shady environment in the middle um, that we should look closer to. Of course, from my own work environment, I look on data protection, I, I look on, on privacy, but there is a lot of other directions, and we'll uh, also meant that, and the other speakers also, that uh, data is being collected from us because we uh, share it with uh, all kinds of organizations because we have to. Yeah? For example, you need to do your tax invoice so you share information. So you should be thinking from that perspective is how can I impact that? What, I, what do I give away uh, and how do I give it away? Protecting uh, uh, it myself or give it only in a blank matter to everyone who wants to know. As Willeke also said, the regulations that we deploy are all always insufficient because there are new insights that we didn't look into when we wrote down our, our privacy statements. Uh, you can look at uh, the AVG in the Netherlands or the GDPR International. Um, sometimes ethical things happen um, and we did not foresee that. Um, so we have also, also to uh, be close looking towards the scenarios that arise on the horizon and we don't have uh, um, regulations for that right now. This is a survey that's being done with, with SURF that's uh, um, a, 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 a organization that all the high schools in the Netherlands work on. And, you, and it is being asked towards the people uh, in, the, in the interview uh, how many confidential data sets uh, are being processed at work and what they uh, uh, specifically need or request from the data sets. And I see that from myself within Saxion as well. A lot of data is being collected. And if I talk to people, I try to convince them, do more with less. With all the information you have, you have also your legal obligations to protect that to the outside world. Also, by the willingness to share data, you should see, and that's also being said with the earlier speakers, what's return on investment and what's the level of trust that we have to the organization or the party that we are uh, um, giving data to. What do we share about the cell? This is a short survey about what I did in the last couple of years. This, this is, is, a, is a very short, and I share a lot about photos and information about myself. Um, but I'm always looking uh, towards the, the, the target and, and the purpose I'm sharing things with. Um, and why, what is the reason I do so? And some uh, personal information I, I don't share at all. So it's a short reflection. I, I did work as a model on the catwalk. I, I, I did lectures with several organizations, with ASML, with Avery Dennison, uh, and with Saxon as well. And sometimes I'm trying to protect information from people uh, around the world. Uh, and people, international students, for example, who uh, study at Saxion. And you see, for example, also people sharing a lot of very personal information about themselves on the internet or on, on Facebook groups. For example, uh, think about identity fraud. You see on the, on the left side, that's a declaration changing gender from a person with all kinds of personal information in there. And I did blur the the, the data and, and some very personal information in this. If I look further and I explore the internet, I see this. I see a lot of personal information that we try to protect from our personal uh, role as a data privacy officer, but sometimes people lose 
uh, lose cards or publish them in a whole. And in the LGBT sense of people um, deploying uh, themselves, uh, being, for example, a, a transgender, trans transgendered from male to female or the other way around, they post all kinds of things on the internet with all the details in it would, would be a reason for identity fraud. So I try to warn them from my experience. Osaxion, how does it work? A part of the application landscape we see on Saxion. So we have a lot of systems. In this, those systems, a lot of data. Some data are, are being merged in data sets. So we have to be very careful in what we do with it. For example, someone wants to take a study in the Netherlands, but you see people are, uh, are going to study link that's called the, the Orduo. Uh, that's the organization that, that combines all those uh, uh, information. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it has a connection with the tax uh, enforcement. Within Saxion and all those systems, we have classified data, we have personal data, we have high sensitive data. So we should be aware about what we do with the information we have on people. And sometimes we have to put all those information in systems because it's required by law. But we have to deal with it. But we have to ask us or yourself uh, again and again, uh, what are you collecting? How long do you keep it? What's the purpose? Can I do it with less? So that's the way we try to uh, educate people and the managers within Sax in, in the Saxion University to think about it before setting up an, a new transaction. A little sample um, from an perspective that you have, what, what, what would I want to know if I uh, uh, have an academia and I have a student who wants to join a certain study? I would need the last name, first name. I would have, it would be handy to have a student number, maybe nationality, but you can e even doubt that. The gender, uh, if you see it from a communications perspective, I, I'm okay with it, but do we really need it? No, it's doubtful. The academia that it, uh, uh, the student wants to study, it's very handy because you have to plan a schedule and the choice of the, the, the concrete study as well is also very handy to have to put the, the right people in the right class. If I look from a, a privacy perspective, what do we have from a student? And it's not a complete overview. Uh, sorry. Uh, and we have also this, sometimes we have a, a, a copy of an identification card, sometimes not even allowed by law. We have financial information. We have the, the national identification number, phone number, study results. Sometimes due to COVID-9 lesson are, are being recorded and we have that information as well. We can, uh, gain data about which people are joining which, le which, which lessons. Uh, we also know who is entering the building by video surveillance. So by default, we collect uh, a lot of information. I can give you a practical uh, uh, example about what uh, arose did this week at my desk. Uh, a department of Saxion uh, installed a doorbell a doorbell with a video capacity. That video is being recorded. It's being sometimes being shared and used for investigations. And we as a private team were not even aware that it was happening. So you see a lot of things uh, are happening uh, all around uh, your own organization. And sometimes you don't even, even be aware about it. Are we ready at Saxion? No, we are not. We have a lot of things to do. Other sample, uh, a transgender, which has not yet uh, 
by law as being declared from male, uh, a female wanted to join uh, a lesson uh, and wanted to perform an, an exam and was uh, was being removed from that group because the paperwork did, didn't match. So we have to do some kind of work over there as well. Um, if you think about uh, the gender X uh, uh, possibility, it's not guaranteed by law in the Netherlands yet. But if you look, for example, what we see in HR systems, mostly there is no possibility to to name someone in uh, as a, as a gender X. We have only male and female in the Netherlands. Sometimes people are changing their name or their gender but in the in the study they are following there is no uh, not yet within in our organization and, and it is broader than our organization there is no way uh, foreseen that people uh, can do this change so your name john then you are named john and only if you have the the law uh, clarification and the right documents you can change it in my situation, uh, when I transgendered from male to female within IBM, some email address that was used in the system was not changed. And I, and I got my new laptop at that time. And one of my former employees, which I was a manager of, looked at me and said, hey, is that really you? And I thought by myself, how do you know? Because yeah, they were for, uh, being forgotten to change an email address. What helps within an organization, and I try to do that myself as well from the LGBTI aspects, is to help people with questions, to being visible, being, uh, uh, being helpful, reaching out to people, be there for them. And sometimes, yeah, data and ethics knowledge uh, is, is not available by people, and people are crying out, uh, I, I change from man to female, uh, but didn't do that from a legal perspective and, and, and they are walking uh, around and the people are ignoring them so that's what i see from from my perspective within suction a uh, question from fred from asml uh, with all the concerns about being visible online as a member of the lgbti plus community how can one still be a role model yeah for me it's an open question just to be yourself just to be open with my length i'm always visible and i i had a, in the beginning i had I had a problem with that because i thought by myself what do i'm doing wrong do i wear the the wrong makeup or do i wear the the wrong cloth but no everybody is looking to watch you because you are a tall woman um and that's where the role model also should be you should be visible um I, I I gave a lot of lectures and tried to be a role model for quite some time. So I, from the student psychologist uh, of the different organizations in Twente, they, they uh, asked me sometimes to speak to someone who wants to uh, be in transition or uh, is in transition and try to be at help. And that really helps. But yeah. From my perspective, I can't dive away. I, when I, I walked to, 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 uh, to a, a building at Saxion, and there was a class having a lecture, and I was walking by wearing uh, wearing heels. Uh, I was uh, about two meter five at that uh, at that point of view, and the people are all were uh, looking at me. And I thought by myself, I can do two things. I have two options: walk through, go to the closet, or. Uh, return to the door and 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 invite uh, the people in the class so i i knocked on the door entered the class and i say yeah it, it, it can be nice to see a woman about two meters walking by but it won't bring you knowledge and the reason why you are here is to gain knowledge so pay attention to the, the teacher and don't pay attention to everyone who is walking by by doing that uh, it gained within Saxion some kind of experience with the students. And now if I'm allowed to, to walk in, inside the Saxion building, 
people uh, uh, all know my name and, and I don't know the name of all those students because I never spoke to them. So you can see um, it gains also a, so, a, a certain way of acceptance uh, to be visible. It, it had also hit it, it advantages. So I would advise if you are a strong person enough to be able to do that, yeah, do it. Don't hide. Great, thank you so much for that answer. We have a chat question coming in live, but it's not appeared yet. Um, in the meantime, uh, just a question from myself to you. As a role model, what kind of positive feedback have you got from, from being a role model to other people who are transitioning perhaps? I try to help them also. What you need, you can now see is the, the waiting time on the list for the, for the gender clinics is about two years. And a lot of students now, due to COVID-19, are more or less isolated. They are at home, uh, struggling with their feelings, struggling with themselves. And being able to be visible and people can, uh, uh, can find you and speak to you, you can help them. Uh, my big advice is to them, prepare your coming out, if, if not already done. Prepare the documents for the gender clinic. See that you get a life description. And you have to gain that uh, to be able to get the treatment. They will ask for uh, uh, um, a personal document in which you stay. I, I, I knew I, when I was six years old, I knew that something was wrong with me, that I was not in the, in the, in the wrong uh, body. But at my time, yeah, I could not do anything about it because yeah, the word transgender even didn't exist. Um, so, so what I try to do is to to give them help in the in the period of the two years before they entered uh, to enter their their, their track um, in their change. Uh, and and from that, can you do can that from different perspectives? You can do that from. Who want you? Who will you want to be if you're going to be a transgender and you're transgendering from male to female, for example? Take my take my own uh, example. Uh, what do you have to think about? Think about the financial implementation for more, changing a complete wardrobe. And take that in mind. Uh, how do you do your makeup? How do you? choose your clothes what will be your clothing style etc etc and th those things people can think about and and do steps in their waiting time so that can be at help just yes. to let them see and what a lot of people do they pick up a magazine and say yeah i will become that but no you won't become that because you're not that person Thank you so much for, for your tips and uh, yeah, insights and viewpoints, Helena. And I really love also the, the, that you, that you uh, see the importance or really highlight the importance of visible out role models. I think that that's, that's what every uh, company and uh, society needs, really uh, strong uh, role models from within the, the community, but also outside, uh, like really having a strong ally community. So thank you for, for, for your presentation, Elena. So these were our speakers for today. I would like to thank all of our speakers. Of course, also the organizing team, the technical team uh, for your contribu contributions uh, for this event. And of course, I also want uh, to thank you, dear audience, for joining us today. If we look at the future, we are currently in conversations with uh, organizations who might want to host the next Tech at Workplace Pride event about a different interesting topic. For now, it's still a surprise and uh, you will hear more next year. But if you do have an interesting idea, then you can reach out to me via LinkedIn or you can reach, reach out directly to Workplace Pride uh, to discuss your ideas for, for our next event. Once again, I would like to thank all the speakers for the time, their stories, their viewpoints, and also, again, thank everyone who joined us today.